we're pretty much live. So hello everybody again, welcome back. And I'd like to introduce Orlando Sela and Wei Zhao. Um, they're going to be giving us uh, a work. Ah, and I'd like to introduce. I always do that. Sorry. <laughs> so they're going to be giving us a wealth of knowledge about flute stuff. What exactly are you guys talking about today? So today we're going to be talking about extended techniques for flutes, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate most most of them are for single flute, and then we're going to play stuff for two flutes just to demonstrate a couple of things. And then as, as we go along, we're just going to do experimentation. So if you guys have your Sibelius or Finale ready, I don't know how what is the best way to do it, to like share your screen, we can play something for you right off the bat. Awesome. That is incredible. Thanks, you guys. Well, I'll hand it right over to you. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the things that you can do um, with the flute. And, and we have divided it into two things. Um, extended techniques that you can do with air and extended techniques that you do without air. Okay. So I'm going to start. You want to... Mm -hmm. Okay, so the very the very first thing I want to um, tell you guys, and this is very important for me that everybody keeps this in in mind. And I always I always start with this um, every every year. This time is going to be a little bit different, but I want to start with. Let me see if I can. Oh, I cannot share my screen. Unfortunately, I think you have disabled that. Sorry, hold on. My bad. All right, now you're you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So now everybody should be able to see um, a screen that says the monochordal philosophy of the flute. Um, am I doing this right? Somebody say something. I cannot read the chat, so. I think so. Okay, cool. So pretty much the, the idea behind this is to tell you a little bit about how we should think about the flute for many of the techniques that we are going to be using today. And um, as, as, as always, I can share this uh, with Elizabeth for later. She can share it with everybody. Okay, so this is the, the range of the flute, right? The only reason why I am um, putting that B within parentheses is because some flutes have that B and some flutes don't have that B. Okay? So, for example, you want to come with me? So, we're going we're gonna to do this. So, come over here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that my flute. It's uh, oh, this way. Sorry, first time using this. My flute has three keys in the bottom. That's a B foot, and waist has two keys. That's a C foot, which means that she can get down to the low C, uh, which is the middle C in the piano. I can get to the B right, right below it. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. Sure. So pretty much, you know, it's a different than the middle C. Okay, it's very simple. All right. So the the range of the flute um, is just pretty much that one. Those high Fs and everything. I mean, there, there's a, a few more notes there. Um, so. Again, it really it depends on a good day or not, and then we'll talk a little bit about it later. Okay, but that's pretty much the range of of the flute. Now you probably um, knew that already, but what I want to drive to is a new way to think about the range of the flute. And I'm going to ask you to think about it this way. Okay, so every time every time you have the flute. Um, it's pretty much a flute is made out of of pretty much one pipe that is you know pretty um, pretty simple, right? Once you overblow, you get to the 
higher octave, right? And then you have to overblow again to get to the next set of partials and so forth, okay? So I like to call those the breaks, and those are usually in the in the C-sharp area there. So I have my friend, uh, my friend Gerardo's flute, which is this teeny little five thing that he made for me, right? And as you can see, it has nothing. It's just one little piece of pipe. It doesn't even have a thumb key, right? So this is again based on a on a on a five, right? On a you know on a on an old flute, okay? So once I play my D, right? I run out of I run out of uh, holes. So then the next thing I'm gonna do is play the same octave, the same fingering, and blow. Right? And I'm gonna keep overblowing. Right? And then it can get really complicated to be able to do that. Okay? To get higher and higher and higher and higher. So when you see the modern flute, no, excuse me. When you see the modern flute, you have all of these extra piping, but this is essentially the same thing as the guy. So that flute gets up to here, and then we have extra notes in the bottom, um, and then it goes, you know, you have all the extra keys that are chromatic, but basically the hand position is the same, and I have a thumb key and whatnot, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah, I also play Chinese flute. I have a bunch of those. Yes, uh, same idea. You don't have anything except overblow, okay? So what ends up happening is two things. In order to get above the first break that you see that there, you have to overblow, okay? You have to just blow harder, right? And once you get past this, this very, very, very last one, right, then everything else here is extra fingerings, okay? So the fingerings are made so that they sound pretty but these are all overtones these are all harmonics really it's just like this one the very first one is the the fundamental tone and then you have the first partial and then you have you know probably the third partial because you know so you know if i finger the c i'm gonna get the g in between as well right so that's why the the title of it is you know how technology has painted our, our instruments okay the idea is that you know if I play a Chinese flute, or if I play this little um, this little plastic flute, right? I'm using the same fingerings, but this one is so nice. It's such a great technological piece, right? It has a certain shape, and the holes are shaped in a way that it doesn't sound like a harmonic. But those are actually harmonics. If I play the next one. Now it sounds like a harmonic. So the, compo the, 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 the the instrument makers, to make it sound pretty, they make different fingerings. So, right? so there's all sorts of combinations in order to make that sound pure as opposed to... Right? So again, it's always... It's, it's, it's always nice to have... What can I say? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry to switch video here. So it's always nice to have that like ability to play something really high, something very pure. But remember, it's smoke and mirrors. This is this is all overtones. These are harmonics. Uh, um, any question? Somebody was speaking. Yeah, I just had a question real quick. If you wanted that overblown harmonic sound at the top register, would you notate that as harmonics? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, so, sorry. No, 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 perfect. Uh, any good? Good questions, yeah. So, uh, and again, if that, save it so that, um, you know, I can I can answer that later. Uh, let's see. Somebody's asking about this one. It's not, a, it's not a piccolo, it's just, again, you can't even see, it's a, it's a PVC pipe. It even has like, you know, like the information there, you know, like a friend of mine made it for me, right? He was working as an acoustician, so he had to like measure the holes and whatnot, and when he was done, he gave it to me, right? And then somebody was asking about the head joints. Yeah, come over and show your head joints. So my head joint looks like this, mm -hmm. and this is ways, right? So again, they are they are modern head joints. They're nothing nothing uh, extraordinary. It's just the materials are different. This one is made out of um, tambuti wood, and the lip plate is grenadilla. 
and this is a hedging made out of oromite, meaning it's gold outside, but inside is uh, silver. So let me see. Uh, Anchorman, yeah, later. <laughs> yes, it does. It does definitely impact the sound. So the density of the instrument, right, of the wall, is going to make it harder or going to be softer. So, for example, this is going to be much a softer sound than a metal head joint, and silver is going to be so uh, harder or brighter than gold, and platinum is really, really, really hard, so it's going to be pretty bright. So that's why Varese wrote for that, for that particular flute when it was written, and George Barrere, you know, had it. So. Uh, it's okay. I just don't let me get out of in too much tangents, okay? Because I have a I have a list of things to do. So thank you. Cool. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep going, okay? So okay, just just continue with this. And again, I I know this might be a little bit um, boring, but eventually, you know, we're going to to get to the um, intri the, the practical part of it, okay? So notice in the last break that I have totally skipped the, the partial in between, right? There's also an A, right? There's a, you know, there's that um, uh, second, third partial. Actually, if you guys can tell me, is the fundamental known as the first partial or is the fundamental known as the fundamental? I always get confused about that. The fundamental I thought was the lowest, the lowest of those that it plays. Right, so that's what I thought. Like the, the fundamental is fundamental, and then the next overtone is partial one, or is it that the fundamental is already called partial one? That is my confusion, because I I've heard it both ways. I I think like someone's saying, uh, fundamental is the lowest, and then the first partial is the next. Okay. Okay, partial one is after the fundamental. Okay, thank you guys for that clarity. So, uh, so this will be the first partial. And then the second partial here is missing, so this is the the third partial here. Okay, so you guys you guys can can see it um, can see it there a little bit. Um, okay, so why is this important? Well, there is is going to be many different uses for this. These are all the the partials that one can get from um, from a flute, right? And you're gonna notice that they are going to be very different depending on the note that you get, okay? So I wanted to explain a couple of things here. If I play the fundamental, which in this place is the, the white note head there, I can get all of these partials, right? Pretty much all of them soft until I get here, that mezzo piano one. And then I'm gonna have to really really put a lot of air pressure in there, okay? And the other thing to notice is that the higher you go with the fundamental, the partials diminish, right? So I actually have two B fundamentals, which is kind of cool. I have the low B fundamental and the, oops, and the next one here, the other B fundamental. And as you can see, um, as soon as the, the tube gets shorter, meaning, you know, less fingers are pressed down, you're gonna get less partials, okay? So, and again, everybody knows this pretty much if you look at a, at a cello or a, or a bass, right? So in my low B, I cover everything, so the air is coming out here, right? So the, the two length, it actually goes down to here, right? Right? But if I do this, again, I cannot get it. But the tube, it's only as far as the tube goes, right? Then the air escapes. So you can think about the tube length going from here to here or from here to here, right? So depending on that, you have uh, the, different, the different things, okay? So why is that important? Okay, one very, very uh, interesting thing for you guys to to know when you're writing tremolos stay within the breaks and this is the most important thing that i can tell you today if you write a tremolo between any of these notes connected by a line 
there will not be any problem. If you write a note here and a note there, things might happen because I have to actually like switch my angle, my lip position in order to make it play. If I am in between the breaks, I'm, I am safe. And you can remember the breaks, very simple, is from D to C sharp, from D to C sharp. You can think about it in a general, in a general way, okay? That is the one that will, um, that will be most, uh, most uh, you know, practical. I should actually share the screen, might be easier, okay? So, for example, if I, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna do the, the tremolo, um, oh no, I lost my, I lost my little thing here that I had my, um, no, C and C sharp, it's good. View, sorry. It, um, Oh, thank you. Keep it here. Ah, I cannot believe. Navigator, no. I don't need the keypad. There it is. I don't know why it's not showing. No, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. So, I'm gonna, I just, um, I'm gonna skip over the, Right? And I'm gonna write the, a tremolo in between those two notes. So that is right in between the... Right? No problem. If I do this... I have to move my mouth like crazy in order for, for me to go... So it's not gonna be a stable, okay? And the only reason I'm, I have to do that is because I have to get to the next, to the next partial, the next break, okay? So um, that's why you want to stay within those breaks. If I play the F an octave lower, no worries, okay? right? So um, uh, C sharp to D does blow. But you have this. But that's, you know, it's called a trill, right? So if you wanted to do, you can throw it flat. So you can do some trill keys to get over to the next one. That, that might help. You might have to ask your flutist about right? But they change between over. So that's why it's, um, it's not going to be pretty, pretty steady. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Any any question? Again, as long as you stay within the, those breaks, your tremolos are going to be are going to be safe. Okay. Um. What's next? Unless there's questions right now, um, we're gonna get to that in a second. Cool. Okay. So. Those are all, you know, things that, that you can do with all the overtone series. But remember, right now, just keep that in the mind for the rest of the, um, the, the rest of the lecture is gonna be the breaks. From D to C sharp, D to C sharp, and D upwards, right? And remember that the flute go in the, in the, in the fundamental, you can go all the way down to C, sometimes to B, okay? Cool, all right. So we're gonna, uh, I mean, composers use overblowing for uh, playing all sorts of, you know, colors, right? And this one is an example from the 70s, okay? Wanna, you wanna play this one? This one is the, right? Okay, so uh, this, is a, this is a great little piece. Uh, and here is, here is my, um, my trick question for all y'all. Knowing that this is from the 70s, do you wanna, do you care to guess who probably wrote it? If you're, if there's a flute player in the audience, don't give it away. Ian Anderson, Takemitsu, 
Lumao. You mean rubber dick? It's actually from the 1870s. I forgot to tell you guys. So this is a pretty old technique. And the idea behind this technique is to imitate an old caval sounding. Okay? So this is like um <laughs> Doppler Raider. I don't think so. But the 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 um the idea behind this um is to imitate that uh, caval sounding Bulgarian Hungarian sound, right? In fact, this is a Hungarian fantasy, Hungarian pastoral fantasy. So it's supposed to sound like those Hungarian flutes. And when you get to this part, So again, as you can see, already back there, they were starting to experiment with, you know, how to work with these um, overtones in order to make it, to make it sound cool. Okay. Um, all right. I'm looking at my cheat sheet. Okay. So overtones are cool and um, they will apply also to things that you do inside the tube of the flute. Um, Ah, that's a that's a great great question. No, I think what he wrote, uh, pianissimo, is just because he wanted it to be very 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 soft. And then he has a fortissimo at the end. I also think because it's pastoral, he wants it to make like the shepherd is now very far away or something like that. But yes, you can control the dynamic of the of the harmonics okay and and when i send you this you're gonna notice that there is um a lot of dynamic markings there because it's gonna take some time um you know to get those those things oh the other thing as you probably already know is um the the overtones get closer and closer and closer as you go uh higher so some of these are so close that you just get the cluster of notes. You cannot separate them because it's just not uh, precise enough. Okay? That works also inside the mouth. So you can also play, you know, the. Right? So you can also play inside of the mouth and getting the. Uh, overtones to happen it sounds completely different and it actually sounds a major seventh below and we're gonna get back to that in a very interesting technique called the jet whistle and the jet whistle you know which you guys love and, and already know is just pretty much playing right so basically what i'm doing is just going very fast Right? So if I do that really fast, it sounds like that jet whistle um, thing. Okay, But it is all harmonics. It's all just going over the um, overtone series really, really quick. Okay, Some of you already have written whistles um, for us. And um, I think I have a guy here that you might have heard of. Uh, this is Salvatore. Let me find the... The toothy place. Yeah, okay. So those are all jet whistles. And again, keep keep in mind jet whistles are probably it's, it's it's just pretty much you have your fundamental which is here, and then everything is done by overblowing, by doing dynamics. Okay. So Sharina is pretty good about it in that. The higher the the arrow, that means the louder, right? And also the higher. Okay. So if I if I am playing, oh, this one is very good. If I'm playing this part here, there you go. So if I play this part here, pretty much what I'm doing is just overblowing more and more and more and more, and then coming back down over that E flat. 
and that's what it is. And what I'm what I'm doing pretty much is just the whole entire right. So it's just overtone series going up very 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 quickly, and that's the jet whistle. Um, questions about that? Anything? Okay. Yeah. So cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on going. One of the cool things about about this um, is that you can actually with the harmonics in flute. You can actually change intonation because you can change the angle of the fundamental. That's really hip. That's really cool because in a, in a violin, for example, as far as I know, if you have a node, if you strive from that node, you lose the, the harmonic. But in flute, when you have that node, you can actually move ahead and you can move the fundamentals. You can actually change the pitch of that, which is kind of kind of cool. Um, uh, he did not. The, the the overtone series is the same for every instrument, every sound made. It's it's always gonna be the same. It's gonna be the same the same ratio, right? Octave, fifth, fourth, blah 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 blah, right? So it's just it's gonna be different fundamentals, right? So you can do. So you can do all sorts of really really cool things because the fundamental changes so it's basically your changes um the, the chords yeah okay uh what else okay you know I, I have so much to talk but i'm gonna i'm actually gonna go away from this and i'm going to um do something completely different we're gonna talk about um glissandos okay and there's two kinds of glissandos when i had a Terrible, terrible fight, right? For what? For what? She forgot. <laughs> no, it's kidding. We were playing one of one of uh, you guys' piece, and you know we have microtones in that piece, right? Okay. So we we discussed. Okay, no, this is the way to do this microtone. No, this is the way to do this microtone. No, this is the way to do this microtone. Okay, so there's 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 different ways to do microtone. Okay, um, and when I mean microtone, of course that that will become glis as well. Okay, so the, the flute is a pretty um, flexible, flexible instrument. Okay, so um, when I, I'm warming up, if I'm playing, I don't know, my A, I can bend down. Can bend up a little bit less. It's almost like a quarter tone up, right? But for the one, it's almost a, a half step, right? And the idea behind telling you that is that we use that sometimes for, for microtones. So, right? So we have to use a little combination of, of things to do, okay? There's another way to do microphone, uh, microphone, sorry, microphone, <laughs> in which um, I actually use uh, fingerings, right? Um, and I believe this is a fingering that I was using for Alvin Speed. Right, and that's another way to bring the pitch down, okay? You did your, um, mm -hmm. come over so they can see you. How do you do your your uh, glissando? I think it's from the C and two. Exactly. Some like a I can. Like you can do this. Yeah, you can also do the key. So those are. The techniques that uh, Wei was using for her uh, microtones. Okay, um, there there is actually a, a, a bunch of uh, microtone fingerings that one can find easily on the on the internet. That is 
right now it's so popular and you're gonna find different different styles okay just be mindful that you look for the right flute because right now there are microtonal flutes out there and um, you just want, want to make sure that you are finding microtone fingerings for the right, right flute so again uh, I have a story Ryan are you are you there when when Ryan wrote this piece a long time ago he used uh, fingerings that were awesome but they were for an Eva Kingma yes Eva Kingma I believe it was a microtonal bass flute or something like that okay so I don't have a microtonal bass flute so I had to come up with a whole entire set of of fingerings and he never talks to me ever after that no just kidding <laughs> but you know it was a different thing so just be careful that you find the right the right microtonal fingerings okay um, somebody's asking about the 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 keys yeah so with the with the mouth you can uh, bend a lot downwards okay and that's something to keep in mind probably uh, about a half step okay and what I mean probably about a half step is because um, the higher the pitch the more you can bend okay so if I'm going here I'm almost at the B flat if I'm here it's not even a B flat right so we used to have an exercise right so you, to try to get low in the lower of the takes even more effort to go down okay so but that can be used for any note in the flute if you want to slide down okay now there are two there are two ways to do really good glissandos with the with the uh, flute and those are these notes that you see here okay and I'm gonna type them up for a second in a second okay so between the B flat and G right and then the between the D and F right or even that So anyway, so as you can see, there's a way that you can slide a little bit better with the with the fingers. Okay. So again, the only problem getting there is the is the break. So going from G to D is no good. Again, we're back to that break that I told you guys at the beginning. Okay. So just be be mindful about that. And the ones um, pretty much between these sorry about the sound so if between these guys you can glaze with the fingerings pretty easy the G, right you know you can you know once you get to the to the you know to the B flat actually I want to say you know in between those you can you can get there pretty easy okay and again of course you can do that and then also you know in this place because it's going to be um, you know is, is the octave right so between those two notes you can glisse very easy with your um, with your fingers and every, every flute player should be able to do that okay so again remember stay within those those breaks why not B flat C and C sharp because we don't have holes in those keys the B flat C they don't have holes so it's very hard to it's very hard to do that okay um, any 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 questions? Anything I'm missing for the dumping about that? The glissando maybe with finger yeah. the, the faster one, like a chromatic. Yeah, and then of course uh, there's always a chromatic glissando. Way it's reminding me about that, right? But you know it's just going more like a chromatic scale. Uh, when you're writing um, any chromatic glissando like that. Uh, sometimes if the note is very long like if it's a whole note just be mindful that you might want to put that starting the last beat or starting the last eighth note or something like that otherwise you might get there something very slow that doesn't sound like a glissando 
that's but that's that's very minimal that's very minimal so um okay cool all right so before we go into anything else a little bit more controversial is there any anybody who wants to try something for for me or for way to play something that you want to try a glissando you want to ask a question about a particular um, overtone a particular thing that you might you might want to show you may want to have yes um, I'm wondering about uh, notating uh, playing on the mouthpiece like the the when you're not like playing the 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 mouthpiece harmonics without the uh, without the jet whistle yes you did them how would you notate that because you 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 did something where you were doing it was not quite the whistle but it was still that kind of thing i'm not sure i know how to explain what you did right so no i know ex i think i know exactly what you mean okay um let me see if i can find the notation very very easily um and i should be able to Okay, so I'm um, easy. Easy to say. You can you you can always come up with your very own notation, right? That's okay, um, Dulaney. Let me try to find some. Uh, because all of the pieces I have, none of them have that notation, which is pretty much um a a black square it's pretty much like a black square on top of the um on top of a of a note okay so i'm gonna show you that i found it okay oh i want to share okay so max dulaney this composer he actually makes the distinction here in embouchure positions about how to put the mouse, how to put the flute in your mouth, right? So away is pretty much like outwards, and then you go normal, which is the U, and then in, and then all the way covered, right? That's that's the way that um, he does it. Okay, and I think I might have an example here. Okay, so that that bar that you see there, um, you start with the regular one, and then you are trilling those those trill keys. Okay, so it goes inside like that, and then goes up again, outside again. Okay, um, does that does that answer your question? I'm I'm sorry, I can I don't know. Yeah. Um, that answered. Um, Natalie had a question, but she's struggling with unmuting. So I'm going to forward her question to you. And she said, earlier when you showed those overtones, were you referring to those, were you saying those are audible just playing the lower note or just the next notes that would happen if you over overblow? Let me see. When it said, or audible just playing the lower note or just the next note that would happen if you overblow? So you're always, you are always, um, thinking about the overtones series. So you can actually play an overtones uh, a different different ways. And I, I know, I'm not entirely sure when, let's see, just playing the lower note or just the next notes that will happen when you overblow. So it, it depends because you can, as, as you know, if you follow the overtone series, you can change, you can change the, the, the the overtones right so for example if i play that um, f sharp that you see here or if i play an f sharp right i cannot get the overtone some of the series here right the series changes completely so in order to get the overtones you always want to finger the fundamental like the real real fundamental so again if i play that b i get all of this if i play this fundamental i cannot get a lot of the ones be before um I hope that answers 
uh, Natalie's Natalie's uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, for Austin, the that's why you will get C four to A four tremolo switching between extreme airiness and overblowing. You cannot flutter tongue to everything. Yeah, we're gonna get to all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally good. The answer is yes. As long as the finger is moving, you can add key clicks to to anything. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a in a second. Those are all great questions. Um, oh. I was wondering if it's possible to overblow um, on the glissandi and have harmonics while overblowing. Uh... I guess that's a yes. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question. Uh, sure. You said screen sharing is fine if you want to pull up a specific example of something. Go ahead. Or would that be like later on? Oh, I have I have a bunch of I have a bunch of examples here um, ready to go, depending on what we are are talking about. Is okay. That it's something I, I just wanted to see in, in a piece I wrote for um, two flutes where there's a lot of like bending off the note involved, but I don't know if, because there are some ordinary notes and there are bending notes, if there's not enough time in between if you're like living off to make the bend possible. Uh, here, let me share my screen. I have two Ian's for that purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. If you can share your screen, we'll play it. Okay, it's not letting me on the other, there's like a black screen that says Ian, that's not the one talking right now. Uh, shoot. Okay. Try now. Okay. Yes, all right. this if there's enough time in between because each of the f sharps is gesturally bent down to kind of imitate this kind of ethereal ghostly sighing and i'm not sure if it's enough time and the tempo is 84 so it's not too fast but i was just curious what your um stance on it was where do you want to play one or two you want to play two okay so we'll play we're gonna hack it sorry well, it's we'll fine. Yeah. So you know, I for something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Three. Oh. <laughs> okay. So you can you can see that in, even at the beginning we can bend that a lot, right? Yeah. I might actually add a finger for the for the bending F. I think uh, maybe two beats. I think it's it's good for the timing. Yes, it's, uh, it's true. Way says that those the having those two beats for the timing is really good. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm just pressing a little bit there, and then just lowers a little bit. So I'm just using a leverage there. You want to try mm. it once again? Uh, Is that is that okay? I mean, as you can see, it can be done. Yeah. No, that's that's incredible. Uh, let me stop sharing the screen for a moment. Thanks. And yeah. Then, no, it's really, really, really good, informative. Let me tell you what what we're talking about. Um, if you can see, I'm doing this with my finger, and you can tell your, or you can even write it. I'm just pressing ever so slightly, and it helps to bring down the pitch a little bit more without making it an actual um, 
no change. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any, any, anything else? Any other? Yeah, um, I've got one actually. So this has to do in regards to singing while playing. I know it's possible, but like, here, let me share my screen quick. There is a certain passage that I have that I'm just not sure how well it works because it's close together. I don't know if you can see that bottom line. I'm trying to zoom in right now, but I can't. There we go. This bit right here, the last two lines. Great. So yeah, let's. I mean, let's talk about uh, singing and, and playing, right? <laughs> So it's totally doable. Um, notice that I am singing low. No. Sorry, I was singing a B flat. I went too low. So uh, one of the things to notice about uh, singing and playing is the range of the flute player. And that is something that you might want to consider. But it's totally doable. Awesome. You want to try it or no? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, no, no, no. This is this is great. This is why. This is so good that you guys can share your scores so quickly. Um, let me get to something. It, it's, it's, this is good because I, I had actually planned on showing some singing and playing at the same time as well. Let me see if I can find it. Which one I want to show first? Let's do this one first. Uh, Toshio Hosokawa. Familiar with him, maybe? Japanese composer, very cool. So let me show you what he does. He's really nice. Oh, I want to try to zoom in a little bit. So it's voice below and flute above. Did you notice that there's an eight within parentheses below that a treble clef? And that is Toshio's way to saying, um, if you're a guy, you don't have to sing falsetto. And if you are... Um, a woman you can sing at the at pitch, right? So the whole So if I sing it as a tenor or if I sing it at pitch then it's going to change a little bit about how how it is. Um, then the other thing I wanted to show you is how uh, Robert Dick does it. Where are you, Robert? Robert Dick uses um, a square hole notation in order to put the, the singing. So the singing is square and all of the other notes are played. So that's another way to do it. And and then um, somebody wrote this piece for me one time. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it now because it's tricky. But he wrote kind of like this incredibly difficult counterpoint. been a while so anyway so you can there, there's very different ways to do singing and playing and you can you can notate it different ways 
and the sky is the limit. It's just a matter of little practice and, and whatnot. So I, I had a question about the, uh, the vocal multiphonics there. Um, so um, when I do them on, on my instrument, which is like euphonium, and, and I get close to the pitch that I'm on, like I'm like singing almost the same pitch that I'm on, you kind of get that interference and it's a little rough on the throat. Do you have like things to watch out for as far as uh, like endurance issues with the multiphonics? Like that wear on you more than other things. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's, it's the same idea. The closer you get to the to the to the pitch that you're singing, is going to make a little bit of uh, interference, like you said, right? So octaves are pretty safe, fifths are pretty safe, and then as soon as you're getting higher to the Try yeah. one. So it's the same. It's the same for everybody. It's just like like everything. Like you know, like when it gets too close, like these two instruments out of out of tune. Um, yeah, Karen, um, I did not, uh, what is the, oh, Brooks question, yeah, what is, yes, Brooks, yeah, it does require a lot more air than usual, okay, the cool thing about that also, and I think I have it here in, um, I, I'm, it's going to take me a little bit of time to find it, so my, I might just um, skip, skip it. But you probably are familiar with, uh, with Brian Fernieho, right? So, um, and I cannot find the example because it's buried in some crazy looking scores. I mean, I have Cassandra's dream song in front of me, right? And pretty much one of the things that you can do with the air and uh, singing, you can shift, you can shift between that. So you can have, So you can shift between more voice, less voice, more air, less air. And yes, you can. it takes more air, so it's important to train your flute player by, um, if you're playing something that requires to be an octave high, I'm doing the extra thing with my lips. I have to press my lips. in order to um, compensate for that lack of air that I'm using. Also, it takes a lot of air to use uh, flutter tongue. The different kinds of flutter tongue take a lot of air. Yeah, Any anything else, any other, any other trials? Uh, yeah, I have a, a question on glissing downward. Um, uh, it might be easier to share the screen so I can explain. So um, when you, when you have a interval wider than what you can actually gliss, but you sort of wanted to just give the sense that it's dropping downward and then you just fret, not fret, what do you guys call it, finger, a new note. Is there a better, I want to show you how I notated it and see if there's sure. a better way to do it. Um, do, 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 do. This is technically for alto flute, but uh, oh, yeah. We didn't know the, the, uh, but, okay. So, like, for example, this is too wide to actually gliss, right? Yeah, it's a little bit, so. So that's the closest I can get right now. So what I'm doing is, I'm doing, I don't know if you can see me while you're seeing the screen, but yeah. what I'm doing is I'm, I'm leaping it down. I actually started to experiment with these three fingers. So I'm doing a little mixture of it, but it's not a pure. I'm not getting all the way down. Right, I have to fake it a little bit. Yeah. So it, Brooks, so you said Brooks, you said this was for alto flute, right? Yeah. yeah. What if this? What if? Uh, what if Orlando played it a perfect fourth lower? 
but that okay. that doesn't have the operations of the the, right, the same right. fingering. So uh, you will still be playing the same finger. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a fair it's a it's a fair thing. But yes, uh, fair. Um, what is it called? Uh, observation. Yes, it will sound a fourth lower. But funnily enough, it's almost like for the flute players. It's almost like reading tablature. You have to just give them fingerings and then the instrument will transpose for them. Yeah. So one thing on Anthony's uh, thing, one thing I've seen a lot of composers to do is to uh, basically have that C be like an inexact pitch and say be like as close to C as you can get. And then you can like start basically on the A flat and see how high you can get and drop down. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm trying to do something else. But I know. Yeah. Now, um, glissing down is good, but if I want to, to finger the A flat because I can only go this high, it's not going to be enough. So, what yeah. I'm doing is just using some fingerings to. Well, yeah, it's like I know you can't get the C, but it's basically just high, like start on the high bit of the A flat and then get down. You know what I mean? Is the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but. So it will be a little bit smaller. Yeah. You, can, you can do it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. Just... So is is the intent clear the way it's written, or is there a better way to say that, where I'm I'm aware you need to cheat, but the, the sound of it, the way you did it, is exactly what I was looking for anyway? So let me, let me tell you how I interpret that, because the smaller note is small, right? I would actually do something like this. Right? So because I see that A flat, I'm gonna kinda like skip through it and get to the B. Right? I'm so I'm kinda like just just seeing it that way. Is that how you meant that? Do you see it that way? Uh, no, yeah. I, I, a little bit maybe the small A flat is a bad idea then. Because I, what I really want is that da, da, da. Yeah. So I would actually what I would do is put a little tenuto marking under the A flat. Okay. I mean, the second one is a little bit better. And I think it depends the A flat and the B natural, how, how fast you want to do it. You want to keep a little longer or you want to keep a little very short? Ah, it's true. So it's talking about are they connected? How long is um, the node, how the speed, everything? You have to consider that, of course. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think uh, I answered that. Let me unshare. Yeah. All right. So, um, just going to uh, let me let me hold off onto onto that for a second. We're gonna we're gonna move into things where you do not need air to make things happen. Okay. Um, and again, this is pretty simple. Okay. Remember the breaks I told you about before. Just keep this in mind. Anything that you don't have air is only going to stop at the at the C sharp, uh, arguably with the keys, you know, E flat. Okay, but then you're gonna have to give some extra instructions. So I say C sharp is is definitely safe. And anything that doesn't require, it's uh, pretty much just key clicks, right? And key clicks. There's many different ways to notate it. Again, you can always come with your own notation. The typical one is the uh, notation with the X head. Um, and I know that there is a, a, a way to find um, a panel here to, to do it, but you know, you can you can find you can find that there is a panel that gives you all sorts of node heads that you can that you can use somewhere. I think it's in notations and then uh, types. You got it, yes. Yeah, you perhaps need to select a note first. You're absolutely right. Thank you for being so patient. Yeah, so again, that's a typical that's a typical um, notation for, thank you. Um, what is it, what did I just talk about? Help, you know, or, oh, no cross diamond. Um, yeah, if I make that maybe, um, yeah, so that's a typical notation for, for key click. Okay, and if you put another, uh, let's say, I don't know if I can do this uh, easily. Um, I'm gonna take this down. 
Again, this is a uh, bad example, but I'm gonna do that. Right? So that means that you would play the note below and hit the key, like, right? That's another way to notate that. But it's the X note head that is very, very, um, very typical. But again, you can come up with your own notation. Uh, your own notation. Thank you for the Sibelius uh, tech support, by the way, you guys. So, so anything that is clicking, you know, it is going to be like that. Anything about clicking you want to say? No. Thanks so much. Okay. Can I ask a very quick question? When you're like playing a note and then you do that key click on like a key, would that actually like subtly alter the pitch a bit? Because you're like putting it down for like, you know, like clicking. It. So I'm, I'm just wondering. Um, I, I missed the very first part of your question. You mean, is it a oh. trill, you said? Like uh, what you just did, like, you know, you are playing a note and then you are clicking, clicking it. So I, I'm just guessing when you like have having the, the key down with it actually alter the pitch of the note you're playing. Oh, I get it. Yes, it depends. It depends. So for example, if you're writing anything beyond G downwards, you should mark this out. So you should take a note between G downwards. Oh, what am I doing here? I have another camera. Between G downwards, right? It's actually that same key click, right? It's actually the same note. But if you go high like a C sharp, C sharp doesn't have a key click, right? I have to kick something out. Or B flat, maybe? Because that's not enough of a key click for me. A little. So I always hit something very low, like the F sharp key, maybe, right? So. And it changes a little bit about the depth of it, okay? Um, one of the things that I do for key clicks is always hit the G key when I'm not blowing air. And the, the reason why I do that is because if I was to do the opposite, you get all sorts of things that are not there. Also, you can go upward. If you know, there's no, I have to hit to come upwards as well. So always, you can always start your flute player, hit the G key, and then you can, you know, you can go any way you want with those guys. Does, does that make sense? Uh, that's too super helpful. Thank you. No, you're welcome. So yeah, it does change the pitch depending on how you hit, but if you, if you put it really far away, from the actual pitch, like a B, if you hit here, it's not gonna affect. But if I play a G and I have to play, I'm gonna sound the F sharp before that. So I don't wanna do that. You are absolutely, absolutely right. So it depends on how how close to the actual note you are. Okay. Um, other things that don't take air or a lot of air are the um, the attacks with uh, syllables. Okay, and there again, there's a plethora of ways how to do attacks with syllables, right? Uh, people write um, entire syllables. People use the international phonetic alphabet as well, and that's great. That's very useful. Um, what I what I usually ask people is to avoid writing vowels because really the flute is only going to be pretty much like a e o u kind of thing. Would you say right? Yeah. So sometimes people might say sa, right? Well, if you go sa, right into the flute, sa, it's not gonna be as much as if you go s. You say sa. you might wanna say sa, sa, sa. but that's a different thing. That's you're like sa, sa, sa. so try to avoid vowels. Try to only use the IPA. It's a it's a very very cool thing to do. Actually, IPA is very cool. You can get your like vowel sound very 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 clear anytime you want to try anything for example you, you want to write something for flute you don't know if it's going to speak loud 
put your hand in front. If you're doing, for example, T, you notice that your hand is going to feel the air. If you go H, it's not going to be so much air, right? If you go CH, you're going to see that there's a lot of explosion in the air. So when in doubt, you can just try it on, on your hand, right? And it's going to mirror the whole... Some people write B. B is very soft. And again, people like it because it's that soft, right? P is usually named pizzicato, late pizz. And T is also a very, very popular one. But it doesn't go up above C sharp, right? If I try to get to the other, I can't. I'm back in the lower octave. So just keep all of them, um, all of them very low. Yeah, it's funny because beatboxing, you can actually notate it very easily. It's just beatboxing is pretty much just attacks of like, it's very, it's very simple. It's just a matter of coordination. So I, yeah, I had a question kind of on this note. Um, like you were talking about alternating uh, like, like different kind of um, like syllables, et cetera, right? So like, obviously like, I know that your double tonguing works like the double and triple tonguing works the same as like brass instrument with the kind of like ticka ticka back and forth, right? We have this like weirder thing, which we call like doodle tongue where like you can kind of get your tongue, like some trombone players and stuff can do it. Do, do you have like an analog on flute? Do you know what I'm talking about with the doodle tongue? Doodle tongue, I don't know what that means. No. It's like uh, you start like multiple tonguing almost like just by catching your tongue in the airstream, but it's like not, it's basically like you flutter so slow that you're multiple tonguing really fast. You can do that? No, I can't. I heard that. It's like uh, you do flutter down, but you can control the flutter, how, how fast, how slow. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I, yes, that's a great question. I, I have tried actually any of the. But that's as slow as I have ever been able to get it. Yeah. I don't know if it has something to do because the flute has, you always have to be like really open and flutter tongue, you need to put air through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, may, there might be some flute players that might be able to flutter much slower. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like a really hard to articulate thing, you know, talking about like doodle, cause it's, it's like, it's not quite that, but like if you do like the doodle in your mouth, like you can kind of feel your tongue just moves a little bit. Anyway, I, I don't want you to take up more time in the presentation, but it's a re it's somewhere in between that flutter and doing that. It's a really weird phenomenon. I'm gonna have to practice that. I'm gonna see if I can find that mid in between. It's really weird when you find the pocket on it. It feels so bizarre. <laughs> like, have you done it or have you tried it? I think you just just need a practice because you have to control your inside a little tongue. Okay, it's just so controlling. Yeah. The air. Um, a note on flutter tongue. Flute players have two kinds of flutter tongue. The one with the tongue where you do right? And the one from the back, which sounds like which is more girdle. Okay. I don't know if you can hear the difference. Yeah, I can hear the how do you how would you say to notate each one? I didn't even I didn't even know that could happen. Um, you're going to you're going to have to specify it in your instruction notes. And again, uh, Fernie Ho just says L flutter for lingual, which means using your tongue, and G flutter for guttural, which means using your, your throat, right? Um, and the idea behind this is that when you do lingual, the tongue is in the mouth, in front of the lips, interrupting the airflow. But when it's behind, it's the back doing it. So the, la the tongue is done and you cannot change it. So for example, if I want to flutter tongue high, I'm using the, the one in, um, with the tongue. I can also use the one guttural one. If I am in the low register, if I use my lingual one, my tongue, I start losing my, my notes because the tongue is getting on the way of the air. But if I use my guttural one, I don't, I don't have that problem. That's so that's so helpful. I, I can't do the the guttural one, so it had never even occurred to me to 
I, I, I actually, I was only able to do the rrr one, and I actually trained myself to do rrr, and you can, you can train yourself to do it. Okay. <laughs> just, just get a cat. I cannot do the big one. I can only do the small one. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So again, yeah. In my, you know, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm lucky enough that I was, you know, that I was able to get to get both. But I don't know. Maybe there, there's a way to do. I know that there's some thing with genetics that some people can do one and not the other. Who knows? So, but yes, you can. You can actually will find some flute players will be able to do one or the other, but they should be able to do both. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I. I don't kill me. <laughs> She's going like this. She's like, <laughs> right? So. Cool. Okay. Um, in the um, so same thing. No air, but in the mouth, right? We have talked about the jet whistles, right? So um, this one is the same thing except with your tongue. And what you do is you um, use your tongue to hit the the part of the flute here. And then you get what they call a tongue ram. And the tongue ram is what it is. You ram your tongue against the, the flute. Right? Um, there's a lot of tongue rams this, this summer. We're really happy about it. Some of them, you can actually mix the jet whistle into that. So, so I'm actually pushing air. You don't have to do it. Right, so it depends. But one thing to remember, it only goes to the C sharp. And then I'm back down to the same one. Um, you can also do flutter tongue inside, right? So you can get all sorts of, kind of <coughs> excuse me, crazy sounds, okay? Uh, where's the best place to mic the flute? Yes, okay, good. I have a clip mic um, that I put uh, here and I pretty much put it right right there and what the reason I, I have a clip mic is because that when I I'm using this you can actually you can actually hear a lot of the vibration coming into this little clip mic I think okay but you don't want to put it too close to here because the air is gonna get in the way so you want to put kind of like the clip mic over here otherwise what I have liked is to put a boom that comes up and downward right so that you're playing upwards at that. If you put the microphone down, you're gonna get all sorts of air streams. If you put it up like that, you're gonna get all the sounds that you want. And then you're gonna put another microphone here for any key clicks and whatnot that you want to do. So yeah. it's pretty much in this in this area and from above. That's what I found is being most helpful for me. And you do like kind of like sharp cardioids on that to like focus on those two areas, like like almost like a hypercardioid, right? Yes, people, uh, again, when I have recorded, when I have recorded, I have had like a microphone here, a microphone here, a microphone at the end, I think like a microphone below and, you know, and then surround them. But, you know, it's like, I mean, but a recording engineer really knows about, about that. If for performance, one microphone, if you have a clip mic, a headset mic I've actually have used before, but, you know, they just come like here, you know, so they're just picking up the frequencies, not so much what is happening here, so. Any, anything else? Uh, these are all great questions. Uh, quick question about the notation of syllable attack. So you would notate that by writing out the syllable that you want? Which which uh, technique? Like for syllable attacks. Yes, you can, you can just write an IPA, you can write a syllable, you can just write a consonant. Just, uh, you know, when you're writing consonants, be mindful that um, different composers might come for, from different uh, places in the world. So an Italian composer might use a syllable differently than a German composer. So a CH for Italian might be different than a CH in German. Do you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. you just have to be mindful of, of that, but uh, you can use a number of things. Just just stay away from vowels. That's the only thing I say. So uh, I'm gonna show you a really- you wanted to, If I wrote okay. pit, hits like pizzicato, uh, would, would the flutist know to do Yes, I would actually write lip pizzicato. Lip uh, pizz there is there is another notation, and I don't know if uh, Sibelius have it. You guys, you guys might know actually um, better than me. Let me see. There's an there's a head note, note head. Sorry, 
and I don't see it. That it looks it looks like the accent. It looks like the accent, and then you have um, maybe the best way to do is a no stem. Maybe yeah, let's do that. You not you? Uh, I'm gonna do that, and then uh, yeah, I'm messing this up terribly. But for example, you can do that, and then I'm gonna say, um, you know, the accent, the accent notes probably this guy, right? So, and then you know, you can, you can have your, 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 your head, and that's like a a D lipids or something like that, like, and that's a typical one. Uh, they are all going sometimes the other way, you know. Um, yeah. So again, you can you can have that um, that note head, or you can just write LP like lip pizzicato, and that's that's fine too. Again, as long as you explain your notation, it can be anything, right? So just just make sure that to explain it. So let me show you a little bit about this guy. This guy wrote for flute and piano pedals. That's only the piano pedals, and the piano has ebos inside the piano. So depending on what you're holding in the piano, it comes up. Okay. So I um, let me see if I can make this even bigger. So pretty much what he wrote for me here, right, was three staffs. The middle staff is actually the the regular note that I'm supposed to be playing. These are kind of like spurs. Spurs is like, you know, like quick burst of energy. And this one on top, this one below, the last one, is actually an S sound. The top one is really, really sharp, and the bottom one is very, very, very dark. So it goes from to right? So when you're playing this, right, you have this And what he gives is he already gives like a whole entire array of S sounds from the right. So he changes it from like really, really, really sharp to really, really, really shallow. Okay. Um, again, that, I've never seen any other notation like that. Uh, fair warning. Uh, I think his wife speaks Sanskrit, and Sanskrit apparently has a lot of different ways to pronounce the S, and that's how. Um, he incorporated that knowledge into into this piece. Uh, let's see. I think I think I'm out of knowledge, guys. Is there anything else you guys mean to to try? Questions about anything else that we have spoken before? You, if you covered air tones, like air tones with and without pitch. Yeah. Okay. So again, like everything is gonna have pitch, right? Um, so. And with air tones, if that's what you mean with, or airy tones, maybe, am I, am I answering the right thing? I think so. like, like when you play a pitch that has some of the air noise in it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it, it's always gonna have pitch, right? And the cool thing is that you can actually say more core, less core, or just air, right? Um, I forgot, uh, we have a lot of pieces actually also because you can have a lot of actually phrases that go from core to air to nothing, just key clicks. <laughs> so um, a, a few of you actually wrote that way and it's really cool. So yeah, you can use airy tones. The only thing I didn't talk about was uh, uh, whistle tones, and we're going to talk about a piece that was written for um, um, actually for I, I forgot which year was it. When was Chase Jordan? Twenty seventeen, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's there's many different ways to do whistle tones, and whistle tones again are. The ones where you play the you finger the fundamental and play very 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 soft. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you can hear that very well. I don't know if that comes up uh, across through the through the computer. Um, so it's like a, a very 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 soft um, way to to play that. So we played this before, in which um, you know one of us was uh, playing the flute whistle tones, mm -hmm. and I was playing the piccolo. Okay, you wanna play a little bit of that? Okay. And something that we arrived here is really cool. When we're talking about tone grams, now I'm playing the piccolo, and I don't know if you can see it. I'm playing the piccolo, um, Wade's playing the regular flute, you know? So let's try this, <laughs> remember? <laughs> Ready? Oh. Okay, so as you can see, when you're doing piccolo stuff, tone gram, it's going to sound adorable, right? Right? So it's, it's going to sound cute. There is actually a great piece that I played for Amplified Piccolo, where you have a microphone inside the piccolo by uh, Deals. Uh, I forgot her name. She works in uh, San Diego now, composer of San Diego. Uh, <laughs> Chipmunk Ripplers. And all her piece, it's all tone grams and key clicks that are super amplified. So it's just like this tiny, like, things like that. And it like, it's really cool. It's with electronics. It's Amplified Piccolo and electronics. So really cool. Oh, somebody knows Chase. Yeah, we love this piece. We play it often, at least parts of it. Um, yeah, anything else? Any other questions? Um, I really quickly threw together some stuff in Sibelius that I was wondering if you could take a look at. Absolutely. Okay. Uh... So yeah, you don't have to like both play this. I just did two lines because I'm really ridiculous like that. Um, but is this how you would notate like um, harmonic glisses? Yeah, that's perfect. Cool. Yeah, and you might want to experiment with maybe having a, a square note head, you know, below or mm. something that says. Uh, finger this note, uh, but and the, then the other one is the sound one. one. But that, uh, that I mean, that comes up, you know, with time, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Cool. You wanna play it? You wanna play it first or? Yeah. So it's a B, no, it's a harmonic. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to let you know is that. Um, it's not going to sound as a harmonic, the very first notes, mm. because, because those are the second regular octave. So let me put it this way. We're already playing harmonics. It's just okay. that what is already done so well that it's not going to come up that way. So we have to fake it. Okay. Gotcha. Having said that, having said that, if you look at the very last bar you wrote, mm -hmm. if you put the lower two notes, an octave lower, And the first flute, that is. Oh, uh, okay. I did not specify, I apologize. I was about to say, I thought the other two were completely... Yeah, so yeah. that sounds... <laughs> but having said that, um, if you write all of the upper notes, uh, let's say, in the, in, I want to say in the second flute, mm -hmm. bar two... The upper, the upper notes, if they were an octave higher, and we fingered the bottom one, try that. Right? So that way you can do it. And then the glide, you know. Or you can just do it with the fingered lip. But you need to have the, the memory of saying that that second that second um, octave of the flute is the yeah. first partial and it's not gonna sound like a harmonic, even though gotcha. it's gotcha. harmonic. Cool. Um, thank you so much.
My pleasure. Anybody else? Anything else? Yeah, I have like a little bit question. I I'm just curious about is it possible to do something like this? Like, you know, holding the same fundamental and, you know, glissing different partials of the same fundamental. I think that works for brass, but I don't think you you know, I don't I don't know. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, you cannot go too fast. I don't know, you want to try? Maybe you can go a little more specific. Yeah, so it's cool. The tonguing will help to get it a little bit more in. I see. So that is the only thing. Now, having said that, that is exactly what happens with um, with whistle tones. But it just happens to be even an octave higher sometimes, or so really, really, really higher. I see. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Oh, I have a very strange eclectic question just because I was curious. Um, I'm a clarinet player by trade, and I've been recently figuring out with open hole instruments that certain harmonics and multiphonics are possible by just having your finger go right above and kind of half hitting. So let me see if I can do it. Yeah. Is such a thing possible with the flute and with the open holes? So, I mean, the, the theory is yes, but it's really, 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 really difficult to find that in between that I think you mean, right? It's like doing yeah. this, right? So mm -hmm. just like pressing, but only like a little bit or just putting your finger like that. Like yeah, because in, in theory, it's like the the air chamber resonates, but your finger being on top of the air chamber actually causes a weird effect. So yeah. it's like the metal's depressed, but your finger's over the metal. Yeah. So again, I I have not seen a book, for example, that tells you to do that. But that mm -hmm. is something that if you uh, let's say if you find out through working with a flute player. That that helps to get a harmonic that is or a multiphonic, that is something that you might want to include in the explanation page. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. But I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. And we do that a lot for like tuning. Sometimes, you know, when you're playing something and you're a little bit too sharp, you want to just press that key just slightly there, you know, to make it. Okay. Okay, Any, anything else? Shall we Shall we call it? I don't know how long are we supposed to go today. Um, it's up to you. It's up to you, but it's up to you. <laughs> well, any, anything else? Any other trials? Okay. Well, if there is anything else you guys think of, maybe you can shoot them an email at some point. But Absolutely. Sure. Um, what, I am, what I am doing right now is I'm editing the videos of the work we recorded yesterday. For yeah. those of you who already sent me your introduction videos, yes, somebody asking, is yes, I got them. I haven't downloaded them yet. It's still right, but I have gotten a, a bunch of them. Uh, 